Thank you. Well, welcome to our next session on studying the Psalms for use in our services. And tonight we're going to start on the most important Psalms, really, because they're probably the most common the ones that are used in our in our daily morning services. So let's start with a uh, prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Shine within our hearts, hearts O oh, loving Master, Master, the pure the light, light of your, of your divine, divine knowledge. knowledge. Open, Open the eyes, eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the message of your songs. Instill in us also the reference of your blessed commandments, so that having conquered all sinful desires, we may pursue a spiritual life, thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, you are God, God, are the light of our souls and bodies, and you we give glory. You, the Father, your Son, who is without beginning, and your all holy, good, and life giving Spirit, now and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Those of you on Facebook, if you click the link down there, that's the bottom of the uh, invite there, it will allow the broadcasting system we have to identify you so we know who is, is sharing this with us here. So welcome anyway. Okay, well, let's get started here. So as, we've, as I said in the beginning there, that we're going to begin to our start on this, the six Psalms. And these six psalms are the ones that are read at every matins or orthro service. And they're probably the most important part of the, of the service. And uh, it takes uh, maybe 10 minutes to read them through, but they're also kind of a summary of, of our way of, of life and very important uh, for us to continue to read. In our daily prayer rule, most of us will probably include either saying these psalms in the morning or maybe one of them each morning, a different one each morning throughout the week. We have someone else entering with us here. We'll see who it is. Welcome. Hello. Mr. Forrest is here. Glad to see him. Sorry, That's okay. That's okay. Glad to see you. Just in time, as they say. Welcome, Forrest. Just getting started. The Madden Psalms are Psalm 3, 37, 62, 87, and 102 and 142. And we're also fortunate in this series we're going to have some nice commentary from a very special person, uh, Elder Amelia Nos, who gives us commentary. Not this week, but next week hopefully we'll have one of his, his commentaries that are very, very nice. Okay, let's start with the Psalm 3, and uh, Andrew, how about reading Psalm 3 sure slowly thing. and carefully for us? Sure thing. Psalm 3, a psalm by David, when he fled from the face of his son, Absalom. O Lord, why do those who afflict me multiply? Many are those who rise up against me. Many are those who say to my soul, there is no salvation for him and his God. But you, O Lord, are my protector, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord will help me. I will not be afraid of tens of thousands of people who set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, and save me, O my God. For you struck all those who were foolishly at amenity with me. You broke the teeth of sinners. Salvation is of the Lord, and your blessing is upon your people. Okay, I, got, I think this psalm helps to have a little context for uh, how it gives more power, I think, to know where David was coming from in this psalm. So I found this, uh, and Forrest, you're aware of these, uh, the your Bible Project, right? I think so. Uh, and they have these nice little videos. I'm going to try, see if I can play it here, whether it works or not. We'll find out whether it works. 
the book of 2 Samuel. Check out the video on 1 Samuel where we were introduced to the book's three main characters, Samuel, Saul, and David, and then also to the book's literary design which first introduced Samuel and then traced the rise and fall of King Saul in contrast to the rise of King David. 2 Samuel tells the story of David as Israel's king and in two movements. There's a season of success and a blessing followed by a huge moral failure and then its sad consequences. And then the book ends with this well-crafted conclusion that reflects back on the good and the bad in David's life, generating hope for a future king to come from his line. So 2 Samuel picks up after Saul's death and David surprises everyone by composing this long poem where he laments the death of the very man who tried to murder him. And so once again the author, he's presenting David's humility and compassion. He's a man who grieves the death even of his own enemies. After this, David experiences a season of success and God's blessing. All of the Israelite tribes, they come to David and then they ask him to unify all the tribes as their king. And so the first thing David does as king is to go to the city of Jerusalem. He conquers it and he establishes it as Israel's capital city which he renames as Zion. And from there David goes on and he wins many battles and expands Israel's territory. Now after making Jerusalem the political capital of Israel, he wants to make it their religious capital as well. And so he has the Ark of the Covenant moved into the city. And then in 2 Samuel 7, he tells God, now that Israel has a permanent home, he thinks that God's presence should also get a permanent house. So he asks if he can build a temple for the God of Israel. But God says to David, thank you for that thought, but actually I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty. Now, 2 Samuel 7, this is a key chapter for understanding the storyline of the whole Bible because God here makes a promise to David that from his royal line will come a future king who's going to build God's temple here on earth and set up an eternal kingdom. And it's this messianic promise to David that gets picked up and developed more in the book of Psalms than also in the books of the prophets. And it's this king that gets connected to God's promise to Abraham, the future messianic king kingdom will be how God brings his blessing to all of the nations. And it's right here in the midst of all this divine blessing that things go horribly wrong. David makes a fatal mistake, not fatal for him, but for a man named Uriah, one of David's prized soldiers. So from his rooftop, David sees Uriah's wife Bathsheba bathing. David finds her, he sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, and then he tries to cover the whole thing up by having Uriah assassinated and then marrying her. It's just horrible. So when David's confronted by the prophet Nathan about all of this, he immediately owns up to what he's done. He's broken, he repents, he asks God to forgive him, and God does forgive him, but God doesn't erase the consequences of David's decisions. And so as a result of this horrible choice, David's family, his kingdom, it all falls apart. And it makes this section a tragic story, much like Saul's downfall. So David's sons end up repeating his own mistakes but in even more tragic ways. So Amnon sexually abuses his sister Tamar and then their brother Absalom finds out about all of this and has Amnon assassinated. And then Absalom goes and he hatches the secret plan to oust his father David from power and he launches this full-scale rebellion. And so for a second time David is forced to flee from his own home and go hide in the wilderness. Except this time he is not an innocent man. The rebellion ends when David's son is murdered and it breaks David's heart. And so once again he laments over the very man who tried to kill him. David's last days find him back on his throne, but as a broken man he's wounded by the sad consequences of his sin. The book concludes with a well-crafted epilogue with stories that are out of chronological order but they have this really cool symmetrical literary design. So the outer pair of stories come from earlier in David's reign and they compare the failures of Saul and then of David and how each of them hurt other people through their bad decisions. The next inner pair of stories are about David and his band of mighty men who went about fighting the Philistines. And what's interesting is that both sections have a story of David's weakness in battle. So in contrast to the victorious David of chapters 1 through 9, here we see a vulnerable David who's dependent on others for help. The center of the epilogue has two poems that act like memoirs and David reflects back on his life. And he remembers times when God graciously rescued him from danger. 
And he sees these as moments where God was faithful to his covenant promise to him and to his family. Both poems conclude by looking back onto the hope of God's promise of a future king who will build that eternal kingdom. Now these poems and then God's promise also connect back to Hannah's poem that opened the book. And so these key passages from the beginning, now the middle, and the end of the book bring the book's themes all together. Despite Saul and David's evil, God remained at work moving forward his redemptive purposes. And God opposed David and Saul's arrogance, but he exalted David when he humbled himself. And so the future hope of this book reaches far beyond David himself. It looks to the future, to the messianic king who will one day bring God's kingdom and blessing to all of the nations. And that's what the book of Samuel is all about. Very concise. Any comments? Thoughts? Does that give you a good context for the Psalms here, you think? It's incredible, right, that David has this horrible part of him, right? But the beauty of it is, is how it humbles him and brings him to total repentance, how God accepts that, right? So it's a beautiful, <coughs> beautiful story and uh, parallels to what Christ does for us, too. If we humble ourselves from our sinfulness, that we, too, will be saved by our Lord and Savior. So who is this? This, uh, this, this particular psalm, it focuses on the, uh, uh, it says a psalm when David, he fled from the presence of his son Absalom in the wilderness. So who is Absalom? You got a little bit of it from the, uh, from the video there. We all know who he is? Know the story well? Not too well. Not too well. Huh? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Well, Absalom was the third son of David. Looking at my notes here. He was also known to be very handsome with very long flowing hair. He was one of David's uh, favorite, favorite sons. So apparently he was also very charismatic. And uh, he also was a great lover of pomp and, and the, the, being the, the chief guy and, and having all the glory that went, went with it. And I think part of the psalm there says that he had a huge chariot and then he would have 50 men that would run in front of the chariot as he would go through the, uh, the city and so forth. So he kind of like was like to show off his, his uh, power and, and kind of like, uh, who he was. <laughs> his skills I guess you'd say right. Well as we saw in the psalm there were these family feuds that constantly caused a lot of trouble in this life of David and uh, his sister, David's sister, Tamar, was raped by another son, Amnon, who was a half-brother of Absalom. So eventually, after a period of some time, <clears throat> Absalom tried to get revenge and had uh, Amnon murdered. So he had Absalom murdering him. But then after that, he fled, but then he gained power and became like the, the king and a power opposing David and actually launched an attack against David and David flees and Absalom is about ready to, to uh, overtake David. <coughs> and uh, so he invades Jerusalem in the process, I think it says there's over 20,000 that are slain. And, uh, and David gave orders to his people to not harm Absalom. So he was saying, we, we got to defend ourselves, but don't hurt my son, kind of thing. So he has a, uh, uh, Absalom has a, an accident and then is killed. Not by the accident, but he's killed after the accident by, by his, uh, those who are against him. And from this, David has this tremendous mourning period uh, that's also recorded in, uh, in uh, Psalms. And then in the scripture that you can read if you have time in Samuel, Samuel 2, right? Second Samuel. So this psalm begins with this idea of David in mourning over his, uh, the death of his, of his son. 
And what did I do with my other notes? Sure, what you grab them there. Are they under here? Okay. So let's go to the commentary here. We have a couple, and we have this uh, this view of the historical perspective of what this psalm's about, of uh, David feeling very uh, remorse about this death of his son. And uh, we also have a, a slightly different view that St. Augustine gives us. So let's read this other view of St. Augustine. He puts a different context on it, which also is a very good one, I think, for this particular psalm. So, uh, Forrest, do you want to read that sure. commentary for, for <coughs> St. Augustine? Um, the words of this psalm lead us to believe that we must apply them to the person of Christ, for they are more in keeping with our Lord's passion and resurrection than with the account which history gives to David's flight before the face of his own rebel son. And since it is written of Christ's disciples, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, it need not surprise us that the disloyal son should be the figure of the disloyal disciple who betrayed his master. Now Absalom, according to some interpreters, signified in Latin Patrix Pax, peace of his father, can be appropriate either in the history of kingdoms where Absalom is at war with his father or in the history of the New Testament where Judas is the betrayer of our Lord. But a careful reader will perceive in the first instance that during the struggle there was peace in David's heart towards the son whose death he ever bewailed with bitter grief. Absalom, my son, he cried, would God I had died for thee. And when the history of the New Testament shows us the great, the truly wonderful forbearance of our Lord, who bore with Judas so long, just as though he were upright, and although he was aware of his designs, yet admitted him to the feast in which he sat before the entrust and entrusted to his disciples his own body and blood under a figure, who finally in the other's very act of betrayal accepted his kiss. We can easily see that Christ showed nothing but peace towards the man who betrayed him, although the traitor's heart was prey to intentions so criminal. Absalom then is termed peace of his father because his father cherished the peace which the son lacked. So do you see the parallel there? So this idea of this one command that we get from Christ, right, of love your enemies, is being demonstrated not only by Christ, but also by David here in his, uh, in this particular incident that this psalm supposedly refers to of Absalom, who's tried to kill David, he's in great remorse for, for uh, his life being taken. So how about, how about the rest of us? How does this love of enemies work in our lives? So I was, I was just thinking as I was reading, both uh, Christ and Judas. Judas was uh, a close disciple, right? Someone Jesus loved very yeah. much. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, David, his son, son Absalom, was someone he loved very much. Often the people who get to us the hardest, the worst, are those people that are closest to us, right? We expect more from them. Mm -hmm. And when they do something, they're supposed to know better because they're in our inner circle. And so it's much harder. And they turn on us. It's much more. But we still yeah. have the love like David shows to his son, right? That is kind of incredible. Somebody he's trying to kill you, right? Your son turns on you, tries to kill you. And you still have, you still have the love that he showed? Or Judas, how he turned on Christ, right? Would you still have a love for Judas, even in that position? What similar yeah. positions do we have? Love your enemies. One of the hardest of the commandments, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. then we want revenge. We have anger. We have resentment. And what do all those things do for us when we carry those with us? I know it seems like as parents we seem to have unconditional love for our children. I mean they'll make mistakes and we um, try to correct them, help them through it and still love them as much as before they made the mistake. So you think it's natural, it isn't something special in, 
David did you here. know I think it's something special that the God that God has given us it's a grace from him yeah. to be able to it's like someone someone was saying the other mm -hmm. day about painful things that how quickly you forget because it's like childbirth you know you go through and you say oh never again mm -hmm. never again <laughs> and then down the road is gee it's time for another baby isn't it <laughs> <laughs> but he, there's something in there that yeah. makes you forget the pain for a woman especially I imagine mm -hmm. and and just remember the the glorious part mm -hmm. so why do we still have so much anger and envy and resentment in our hearts and of course those are things that block us from our relationship with God so we, David's given us an example here where, of his, his repentance and all that brings him closer to God than we can almost imagine, right? And how he helped him in many ways as he goes through the rest of the story. But why do we have such difficulty with uh, being getting so easily angry and carrying resentments? We're prideful. And I think in our the way that we're brought up today, you're always taught up to stand up for yourself, to never back down, to never let anybody run over you for any reason. And for me at least, my biggest struggle with that is is feeling like that. I hear I hear my dad's voice in the back of my head. You know what I mean? <laughs> like don't ever start anything but always finish it, you know? And that's mm -hmm. he had the right idea by teaching me that don't let people bully you, but that's hard to overcome. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh -huh. Especially in our society, because you're seen as weak if if you let people run over you if you respond with love you're seen as weak especially if you're responding to somebody who doesn't believe in that or doesn't see it as that they just see it as weakness so this is one of the big dif not difficult this is one of the things that makes christians so different in the world right from the from the norm you might say of how people uh, normally respond well god teaches us to be uh, meek mm -hmm. And not aggressive. We'll come back to at the end here with I got to some uh, little passage from uh, Saint Theophon the Recluse on the kind of the way of life, the struggle that we have to overcome these passions that we have built up in, which is what what we have to overcome. The self centeredness leads to giving fuel to all these uh, passions that we naturally have. Let's go on and talk about the first couple of verses here. It says, uh, verse 1, O Lord, why do those who afflict me multiply? Many are those who rise up against me. Many are those who say to my soul, there is no salvation for him for him in his God. So we have a commentary here from Theodoret, which says, Many, in fact, are the enemies of every kind who assail me from all sides. But more numerous are those who trouble me by their mockery, their claims that I am bereft of your providence. Yet I know that you would not persist in ignoring me despite my many feelings. So I just think of those times where, you know, I felt like in great difficulty and people weren't necessarily supporting me or against me. And how difficult it was for me to, to remember to turn turn to God, right? I mean, that's that's the time when we we have to, and this is what we'll see David cons consistently does in these <laughs> difficulties. I can't imagine even having. <laughs> he goes on here and says, Yet I know that you would not persist in ignoring me despite my many feelings. We see the power here in this song. On the contrary, you will raise me up, the one who now humbles himself to, for the sin he has committed, and make him appear stronger than his foes. In fact, he intimated as much by saying the following, which leads us to the next verse. Before we go on, we've got a comment here. I'm going to believe it. It's, are we going to uh, record it here? Let's see. I don't know which came first. We'll see. We have a comment here from XYZ, I guess. I don't know exactly who. But it says, I believe you are a stronger person when you put up with different people's craziness and keep going. That shows my true as God Christ has shown me. So this is the strength we can get from the Lord, right? If we can remember. But to me, I know that's difficult to always remember in those situations. We have another comment from Ian, I think. Maybe because we're not as humble as God calls us to be. 
Yes, isn't this the, this is the whole thing, isn't it? Humility. What is humility? What does that mean, to be humble? Christ is the model for us, right? So, can we be humble most of the time? Or do we give in to this, I'm in charge, kind of me, me kind of thing, right? And of course, we're all called, the, this generation is called the me generation, right? What's the next generation called? We've got another name for it. Uh, so we have another comment here. Uh, love and obedience is the comment from Eon again, is what it takes to be humble. Love of God, love of something greater than yourself, something more important than yourself. Um, love of others, he obviously loved his son like you were talking, he said he didn't naturally do that. Um, Although the extreme condition here is he's fighting him in the battle and overtake him and trying to kill him off. Um, it shows maintaining that love is part of that humility, right? What do you think, Forrest? Humility. What's it for you? Um, I'd probably say it, it's grounded in um, a trust in God, that faith in God that um, he's looking out for you not leaning on your own um, desires and will, but trusting, especially when adversity comes, right? Trusting that he's in that. Um, Instead of going to the blame game, they go to the hope game, right? <laughs> we have hope in, in God. He's going to take care of us, right? So when that happens, yeah. you're giving up your, your selfishness, right? Your self-centeredness, aren't you, in that process? So... Putting God first is what humility is about, basically, isn't it? Putting God first over all our what wishes about and putting desires. Putting the other person first. Yeah, Instead well, first God, we love God, and then we love other people, right? Without loving God, we probably aren't capable of having that complete love of the other person. Mm. And without loving the other person, we probably lose our ability to love God, too, right? So yeah. we're separated either way, they're, right? They're, they go hand in hand. So the, the two great commandments, right, are, are so central to all this. They're so simple, right? It's so simple. It's so difficult to live. Okay, so he goes on, he says, then he, the statement, the commentary went on, saying, and then following, by saying the following, but you, O Lord, are my protector, which is what we've kind of been talking about here, my glory, the one who lifts up my head. So that's how we can do it, by the Lord being the protect, protector. Yeah, the right says, that is to say, I have confidence neither in kingship nor in sovereignty. Instead, I trust in you to be my glory. Here I have a thought to throw out here. Is in this current time, we're in the midst of uh, political, what would you call it, warfare, right? Going on. And when we are fighting so hard for these political things, who are we putting our trust in? Are we keeping our trust in God? Or are we putting trust in there's going to be some magical solution for everything we don't like in the world through our great political leader? And don't we kind of tend to boil it down to, it always seems to be focused on one person. Um, can that one person have all that power over our lives? Really? What's going on with these, all this political stuff? So many people are, are hung up in it. They spend hours watching, following getting upset, getting angry, yelling at the television set, and so forth, right? What's going on there? What do you think? Too much change too fast. <laughs> <laughs> we forget, don't we, aren't we forgetting, right, about the central idea of God being, being the son. You are Lord of my protector, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head, right? Well, it's a lot easier if you, if you just let it go in and out and know that the Lord is in charge and he definitely knows what he's doing even if we don't down here mm -hmm. <laughs> know what we're doing so we can trust in that yeah and that's comforting and uh, what's that what also do the politicians tend to do for us they tend to 
play in our fears, right? So yes. the raising up Eight the fear of this, the fear of that, the fear of whatever, right? Uh, so they're suddenly going to solve this fear that they've raised up, raised up in, within us. But what is this fear? What, if we have fear, what does that say? We've lost our faith. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> yes. Fear is a good, good indicator that our faith is very weak. What a kind of fear it may be. Maybe there's all kinds of them, right? Uh, let's see. Hines says, brings to mind something his fellow pilgrim shared with him. If you are praying, pray more. Julianne says that. Says that. <laughs> and he had a firm spirit. You know, we kind of been saying that we're not trusting in God, right? We have yeah. fear. So every time we're moved by those political ads or whatever it may be, remember that we're. God's in charge here, right? But you, O oh Lord, are my protector, my glory, the one who lifts up my head. So this becomes something in our morning prayers, in these, this psalm in particular, uh, if you or something you say every morning in your morning prayers, it becomes part of your uh, reminding you and, and your makeup becomes uh, more clear on what, well, who's in charge here. Let's go on. Let's read and have some comments too. He says, conflict we have here and the distress that conflicts brings for fighting battles is one of the major motives of the book of palms so palms psalms excuse me this is not a prayer book for the non-combatant and unless a person is actually engaged in hostilities it is difficult to see how he can pray this psalm so what war are we in do we see ourselves in combat like Reardon says, says here, how, what combat do you see in your life? Well, for Andrew here, the combat's going to be the, for the military. <laughs> it's going to be external, <laughs> external right? External, yeah. Mm -hmm. combat what's, our, to, what's our personal combat? combat to be right? mindful. It's like as soon as you finish your prayers in the morning and done those things, then you go off to work. And very quickly, you kind of get on with your tasks and that gets put in another compartment. Now you're focused and you don't remember what your prayer was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Watchfulness, mindfulness, those things that we have to develop, right? To keep this remembrance of who God is. And I guess as this faith deepens, it becomes easier, right? Because we receive grace. And if we participate in the sacraments of the church regularly too, we're receiving that grace that's nourishing that soul, making it stronger in the presence, ever more stronger. Every cycle we go through of that renewal. Confession, the same thing, right? Where we have these, uh, where we haven't been kind to our enemies, so to speak, right? We're carrying these resentments. And we give them all up in, in confession and we're renewed again. And we start over again. So we have all these wonderful um, benefits that are Christ has given us through his church. I think there's another comment here. Jamie is with us. Hi, Jamie. Combat against Satan, against our own sin. So all these forces, as Paul clearly says for us, right? He doesn't know why he does what he what he does. Because there's obviously some someone other than me that's doing this. Some force that's that's working against us in our being that is the the spiritual warfare that the saints all talk about. And it's real, right? And we all struggle with it. All of us. Even the saints, they, they write about how they struggle with it. So if we're not struggling with there's something that we are missing, right, in our own life. If we don't sense that struggle, uh, we have to then maybe go back and re-examine our, our own spiritual life. See, what's, what's missing there? He goes on to say, To pray the Psalms correctly, it is very important that we properly identify the enemies. Some modern Christians, not understanding this, have seen gone so far afield as to exclude certain of the psalms from their prayer, attempting to justify the exclusion by an appeal to Christian charity and the spirit of forgiveness. Anybody else? Anyone else have this experience of reading the psalms initially? I know I did when I first started reading the psalms. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> These don't sound very Christian, right? Because there's all kinds of battles going on in the, in the psalms. I don't think that's an uncommon 
common thought. He says, he goes on to say, this is unmitigated nonsense. Sounds weird if you ever listen to him talk, right? The enemies here are the real enemies, the adversaries of the soul, those hostile forces spoken of in the very first verses of the book of Psalms, the counsel of the ungodly. For we do not wrestle, after all, against flesh and blood, but against spiritual hosts, the wickedness of the heavenly places, the evil demons, the Satan, and so forth, this evil force. To relinquish any one of the, of the Psalms on that excuse that its sentiments are too violent for a Christian is a clear sign that a person has also given up the very battle that a Christian is summoned from his bed to fight. The Psalms are prayers for those engaged in an ongoing spiritual conflict. No one else need bother even opening the book. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, and uh, John, uh, Ian, or Juliana says, Yes, I agree. I also find that when I used to read them every day, that on certain days they are more helpful and applied directly to something going on in my personal life. Because I read every day, they are more meaningful and less, what is it, I can't see it here. Harsh. Harsh. True. My experience too, I agree. It's interesting the use of the words combat, battle, conflict, because when we think about our external view of it, me being a soldier, I think about the way that I was, you know, taught about combat. Mm -hmm. You hurt me, I hurt you back. You try to hurt me, I stop you from hurting me. Right. One of those things. But here you're talking about a different kind of combat. You don't respond with, you don't respond to violence with more violence. It's a different kind of defense. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's just interesting that that's the imagery that's used, that that's the poise that we have to go about it, but the response isn't more violence. But I, I think that that's just the, the mindset that you have to have mm -hmm. that that you're in a battle but you 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 just can't respond with more violence per se you can't you can't punch back literally mm -hmm. you know this is like a, well i think elder thaddeus saint porphyrius did teach the same thing that this love that you have has to be for yourself as well so when you find yourself in this conflict and these thoughts going through your mind that you're so upset that they're there, right? And you want to get rid of them. You don't want to get mad at yourself, be angry at yourself. You want to have the love for yourself and just reject them, right? And call on God to help you and call for his grace. Mm -hmm. Again, with that love and gentleness. And that way is a way you're going to beat those enemies for those forces that are in your in your mind. If you I think St. Perfurius says, if you attack them head on, they're only going to get worse. So you can make them stronger and more intense in your own in your own being. So you mm. have to be gentle with your yourself and dealing with them. As you, Andy, what you said remind me of that. Okay, we have a commentary here from uh, Origin. It says certainly people place their glory in various places. Some in their country, some in family line, some in beauty, some in the strength of their bodies and their skill of competing in the contest. Being very elated, they have overcome these people or those by their physical struggling. Mm -hmm. So what is our place of glory? <laughs> it raises that question, right? Where do we place our glory? Because we definitely all do, right? We could probably see it better in others than we can in ourselves, to be honest. Mm -hmm. We know everyone has their own little spot of glory, right? Mm -hmm. But what is ours? That's the, that's, the, that's the key task, isn't it? To really get honest with that and to uh, ask for God's help to, to undo that. Because in truth, he goes on to say, God is the glory of the saint who trusts him. Glory, I say, not blindly credited, but credited through faith that is reckoned as righteousness through which one is enabled to see the signs of a present God and participate in his strength. So God was the glory of Moses who loved the prophets so much that he revealed himself to the point of showing his faith 
face before all the Hebrew people, before the Egyptians. God was the glory of the prophet Elijah, who revived the son of the widow and begged for the rain to be held back and who continued was heard. God was speaking truth, therefore, when he said, I will only honor them honoring me. God is the glory of them who are magnified in their strength, which no one other than the Father places in them, who hand themselves over to him for sustaining their souls. So as we see our own glory, we have to remember where that glory comes from, right? We all have skills. We have glory that God has given us to use for what? His doing His will, right? So it's the glory isn't bad. It's that we maybe attribute it to our own own selves, our own efforts. Uh, like we've done something special as opposed to something that God has uh, provided for us. Any other thoughts? So one more comment here. Comment here. Theodore of, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Mupsuestia. Mupsuestia. The strength of a stable spirit that is greatly tested in adversity must be considered because it possesses hope, even amidst the greatest anguish it does not yield. I, I made an underline this one a stable spirit. Is great that is greatly tested in adversity. So this idea of a stable spirit, what does that bring up? What does that image bring up? Someone that's not easily moved. I mean, um, by the the trials in life. Kind of in maybe this. Dispassion, right? Of being uh, not having the passions flip it from one way to the other. So an unwieldy spirit is one that's kind of running wild, right? Uh, like uh, someone used the analogy of wild horses pulling a, a chariot down the road, right? Where you can't you have no control. The reins don't work anymore, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, so a stable spirit is one that's under under control, so to speak, isn't it? So we can link it to to God rather than that's our own passion. Kathy said the word meek earlier. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Stable spirit is a meek spirit. That's a good one, right? Good way of thinking. Yeah. And why is this important? It says because it possesses hope, even amidst the greatest anguish, it does not yield. So you read the stories of these martyrs and the saints, and how in a great, I mean, the way they're tortured is horrible, right? They're pulling fingernails out, pulling teeth out, driving nails through their body, scourging them with uh, sores, and then putting vinegar and lime and sawing off their torches limbs. and burning the body. It uh, goes on and on, right? And these saints just stay steady, steady in their faith, without wavering in their faith to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So. I would guess because they're steady, they don't feel the pain, right? They don't feel the anguish and the pain. They have the joy of grace that probably comes to them right? big time. I think another testament to that is how they are faithful even when they know it's coming. Mm. I was reading about, um, gosh, I can't stand that I don't remember his name, but he was a bishop of Antioch in the 3rd century. And uh, he was going to be martyred because the emperor of Rome called and told him you're going to be martyred unless you sacrifice to me as a god or something of that nature and he said give me the names of all the Christians in your diocese and he gave him two names one was his name and one was the name that people in his diocese called him he ended up being pardoned but as far as he knew he was about to be tortured and martyred and he still never gave up the names of other Christians mm -hmm. knowing that that would have just made it worse for him it's amazing. I wish I could wow. remember his name. That's so all many, great. all of our saints have stories like that, right? Yeah. Either from their what they personally sacrifice, or what they face in anticipation of most horrible things you can imagine. 
this is whole idea of the, of the emperors, right? To have these tortures because most people didn't live in fear, right? So they behave and they would do that. It's a very common approach yeah. of a lot of people dictators becoming bishops, right? That was a death sentence, right? <laughs> I, I mean, in this, in this time. Was it? In oh, you mean second, in terms the of the second uh, and third century? In terms of being a persecutor, yeah. Well, it depended a little bit where you were, but yeah, for many, yes. I mean, they knew they were going to face it, but they were carried by their, their, uh, their faith, right? Okay, we go on to voice verse 5 here, right? I cried to the Lord, my voice. This we heard before, right, in the other Psalms. A cry to the Lord. And that was our energy being poured out with my voice. So that's why we tend to read the, the six Psalms. I should have read that other thing by Jesus. The beginning of the six Psalms are read in the morning. And they're read in a very special way because they're read standing and they're read without movement. And they're read, we don't even make the sign of the cross when we come to the, the break in the middle of them, right? The, when we go to the, from the first class to the, the second And the break class. says, glory to the Father and to the Son, and you don't do your cross. You don't do yes, your cross, exactly. right. You stand straight and still, right? Still. Focused on the, uh, but we would do the same with our voice. And uh, maybe I'll just read that little thing from Jesus and see if I can find mm -hmm. it. Here's a... Uh, yeah, we don't do this at church. Jamie says... Uh, that she was, she was told that technically in church, one person is supposed to read them. There's not supposed to be the going back and forth. It's supposed to be one person. Oh. Again, with that, I think that stillness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is it how you guys do it, or you go back and we forth? We go back and forth. A lot of times, because uh, so Titi will be there, so we'll alternate with the group. Oh, you mean the, the different psalms? Yeah, the different psalms, but one person's supposed to read all six psalms. I can't remember how they did it in Monopolis, do you? I don't think one person just read them. It was hard to tell. It was all in Greek. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, well, I think were, one person read it. If you were there at the time, they would know, right? If I was, <laughs> like, if I, I was there on time. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning. If I had the, if I had the gift of <laughs> tongues, maybe. I would. Okay, here's the St. Pacio. I did pray for that. He says, once we were housing a priest at Ronnie Kita Monastery, and at the six Psalms, yeah. He lowered the stall and the seat on the stall and sat down. Father, I told him, they are saying the six songs. And then he replies, this way I'll enjoy them better, he replied. <laughs> what I told him seemed strange about the six songs. And there were other fathers who were old, that were standing. They were holding onto the, uh, this, this chair and they didn't rock at all. It's one thing to be tried, to be sick, for your feet to shake and for you to sit, Christ will not condemn him. But it is another thing to think that it's better to say, I enjoy it better sitting. How will he justify this? The spiritual life is not enjoyment. If you feel pain, sit. Christ is not a tyrant. And Abba Isaac says, if you can't stand, sit. He doesn't say, if you can, sit. <laughs> Elder why don't we sit at Psalms? He, he asked him back to St. Pace. Because it symbolizes the judgment. So this is the reason we have the stillness. Because of this, when the six Psalms are read, it is good for our news to go to the hour of judgment. The six Psalms last six to seven minutes. In the first stasis, we don't even do our cross because Christ will not come to be crucified, but he will come as a judge. So we're waiting of the judgment where we stand reading the song. Mm. Okay. Coming back to the verse, I cried to the Lord in my voice. Theodoret says, Now the verse is not to be understood as referring to a loud cry, but to an earnestness of spirit. Earnestness of spirit. Is that the same as this stable spirit? Another kind of image there. Earnestness of spirit. Kind of has the same earlier idea, the steadiness, right? Earnestness. A little different emphasis there, you think? You saying? Thus, the God of all spoke to Blessed Moses, as he were preparing to flee Egypt, who said not a word, 
Why do you not, why do you cry out to me? Calling silence, a cry on account of the earnestness of his mind. Because he uh, then told him, to uh, God then goes on and tells him to raise, raise his rod and part the, the waters of the Red Sea. So this was like a quiet uh, prayer, I guess you'd say, right? And God answers it, knowing he was, he had earnestness of spirit. Okay, Theodore of Mopsuestia says, It is the greatest faith that allows no hesitation for seeking the help of God for himself, and that approaches with confidence his demand. So this idea of no hesitation, does that relate again back to that same idea of stable spirit, earnestness of spirit? We have a comment here from uh, John or Juliana. St. Silwan says, We must always remember that the Lord sees us wrestling with the enemy, so we must never be afraid. Even should he, should hell fall upon us, we must be brave and maintain the faith. Okay, verse 6. I laid down and slept. I awoke for the Lord will help me. And Theodoret tells us here, Frequently, the divine scripture calls disasters night because those who fall into extreme darkness think they are living in a kind of darkness. On the other hand, sleep is associated with nights, so suggests troubles and release from them at the same time. You see the words, I awoke because the Lord defended me, means this. I benefited, benefited from divine intervention and so proved superior to the evils that befell me. So I guess it also makes this fit as a morning prayer, too, in a sense, this concept of I lay down and slept and I awoke, for the Lord will help me. And we awake giving glory to God for surviving the night, I guess you might say. Isn't that one way to think of what, what he's saying here? And well, course, surviving the night, and yet I was not found under judgment. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. But it also could be this other idea of darkness, right? Because when we are troubled, we kind of get depressed, right? We get a sense of darkness comes over us. And again, we awake knowing the Lord's We awake because the Lord, we know the Lord defends us, brings us up out of this stupor, this negative way of being. Okay, let's go on to uh, verse 7. Now, let me refer to St. Augustine, re refers this to the resurrection, this idea of coming out of sleep, of uh, the resurrection. He says the prophetic psalms are by no means silent as subject to resurrection. For unless one sees in his, this sleep the death and this awakening, the resurrection of Christ, thus prophecy, one is reduced to the silly supposition the prophet wished to communicate to us the really remarkable news that he himself fell asleep and later woke up. So this is giving a much deeper meaning to it. So you might think about, what, what, what do you imagine it to be like to die and to be resurrected? To die, we say it's falling asleep in the Lord, right? And to be resurrected is being alive with a new spiritualized form, right? So it might be something, something you might want to think about, reflecting on. Verse 7, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who set themselves against me. I guess these are all the demons, right? They're attacking us. Uh, St. Theodore says, in this verse, the psalmist is not moved by his own trials to the point of despairing for the help of God, nor he dissuaded from a position of faith by words of reproach. He, having learned by experience, by experience the fullness of previous help, cries out most confidently, after the kindness of God towards him through which he is freed from all the entangling of his troubles. So I think that's a good thing to remember too. You think of all these troubles that David went through, it gave him incredible strength. And so too with us, these trials and tribulations, if we approach them properly, will give us greater strength so the next ones come, we get stronger and stronger. And I think this is why David seems like such an incredible uh, saint to us. 
Shall we go to the last? Oh, well, no, that's not the last verse. The next verse is, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all those who are foolishly in enmity with me. You broke the teeth of the sinners. Teeth of the sinners. Another interesting image. <laughs> Theodorette says, By your mere presence you succeed in scattering the countless thousands. Make me as a share of your complete salvation. Just as you made those pay the price for the injustice who wrongly made me the butt of the enemy many times, neighbors and foreigners, Israelites, Amalekites, and of course Saul in particular, now reward me with salvation. The phrase breaking their teeth means depriving them of all their strength. This by comparison to wild animals which be bereft of their teeth are quite undaunting and open to attack. And so you need some explanation for the breaking of the teeth, right? At least it doesn't make sense what you think of an animal unable to attack when they mm -hmm. lose their teeth, right? It gives you a sense of Aren't the, the de image there demons is described as gnashing teeth? Yeah, I guess in some places it's they are. Yeah. That's the same, same kind of imagery, right? Of taking that away their... coming at you is going to eat you up, right? Their ability to attack. And we have Augustine says out here in the middle, opposed to these teeth are the teeth of the church, by whose authority believers are cut clean away from the error of the heathen and the whole range of heterodox opinions and are brought over into that society which is Christ. So there's a different kind of teeth. A common kind of teeth. I think we got another comment here. Is this the same as the gnashing of teeth? I think it's the same image, right? Mm -hmm. This fierce Diversity. kind of thought. And then uh, Augustine is bringing us to also think about where we think of teeth in a, in a positive way by thinking of the, the teeth of the church. It says here mm -hmm. too, Augustine says the, the phrase teeth, the teeth of sinners can also be understood as those sinful leaders by whose authority a person is cut Mm -hmm. from the community and those who live upright lives and is incorporated so to speak mm. yes last verse salvation is of the Lord and your blessing is upon your people Theodorette says I have no hope in human beings he says rather I expect salvation from you not myself alone, but also your people who are fighting with me. Yet I am distressed also for those who are fighting. After all, they bear the name of your people. So grant the blessing of peace, Lord, to both sides. He intimated as much, in fact, in the words, May your blessing be upon your people. Blessed Moses, remember associates, peace with blessing. And even if in history we find blessed David very concerned for the people, and even his uh, Paris parasite, which means the murder of relatives or parents, uh, son, Absalom, he was more, or uh, yeah, Absalom, he was more anxious for peace than for victory against people. Wow. So also his idea of this community of believers, right, that we have a community and that we aren't exclusive, we're not, we don't want to shed ourselves off from those that aren't believers, or those that are Methodists, or those that are uh, Baptists, or whatever it is, right? They're all part of our our family that God has, has created for us. And we need to have love for all of them. So our community has to grow and expand, and we have to expand this love that Christ gives us. And if we have that gift, we have to share it, right? That's our duty. Well, I was going to share something from St. Theophon, but maybe I'll have time next time. For those that have this little book called Paths of Salvation, one of my favorite books. It's called The Manual of Spiritual Transformation. It kind of takes you through the whole process of, of being awakened and becoming uh, glorified in the last, last few chapters. But he talks about the guiding rule for God-pleasing life is the uh, ascetic... Uh, struggles and these all these disciplines that we have 
and how we have to be self-opposing to all these uh, forces that, that distract us wherever they may come from, uh, whether it be a, a man that's an enemy or a woman that's an enemy, or whether it's these demons that are, are attacking us, right? Wherever that, that form may be. And they call it in the, the Russian is uh, prodvi, struggle, labor, and uh, that's what we have to do. So maybe maybe next time will be a place because the theme of the uh, Psalms don't get too far away from this idea of the spiritual struggle that we're in. So any last comments before we break the session for today? You know, I'm just reading this Psalm now. I'm, I'm reading it like waking up at the judgment. Right. So read it again slowly for us. And There's the closing. Well, so, but I'm thinking like the ten thousands of people who are against me. Maybe these are demons who appear in the judgment to condemn you. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you're praying for God to deliver you. Yeah. Those. Andrew, you want to read it again? You read it so beautifully. Sure. <laughs> It brings us to the reality of where we are, right? That's, that we're going to face, we're all going to face that. So being reminded of that from this psalm is really important. Right? Psalm 3, a psalm by David when he fled from the face of his son Absalom. O oh Lord, why do those who afflict me multiply? Many are those who rise up against me. Many are those who say to my soul, there is no salvation for him and his God. But you, O oh Lord, are my protector my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord will help me. I will not be afraid of tens of thousands of people who set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, and save me, O my God, for you struck all those who were foolishly at enmity with me. You broke the teeth of sinners. Salvation is of the Lord, and your blessing is upon your people. With that, may everyone have a blessed week. In the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen. Good night. Good night. Thank you for all participating.